Well, we are very fortunate tonight because we have with us transportation experts. That's right, real transportation experts. And the most important part in addition to that is they don't have a dog in the hunt. Jim McIsaac and Emery Bundy right here on Public Exposure. I'm Stan Emmert, and it is just an honor to have you both on Thank you. Uh, because I have followed your work for the past, oh, I guess 10 years now since Sound Transit. So Emery, Jim, welcome to the show. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, a little bit of qualifications first. Jim, transportation engineer. Transportation engineer that uh, began 40 years ago with what was called the Puget Sound Regional Transportation Study. That was the first Moldy County study in this region. And I've been involved in both in working in as a consultant transportation planning work as well as overseeing a lot of the government projects. Sound Transit's been one that's been particularly interesting and a lot of effort, effort expended on that for the last 10 years. Well, as a taxpayer, interesting is not the word that I would say about it, <laughs> but uh, Emery, you have studied this backwards and forwards and probably are one of the most knowledgeable persons ever. About well, but, but if it's more a citizen's knowledge than, than a technical expert like, like Jim, I, I started taking an interest in transportation when I was working in television in the 70s and just because I could see what a significant energy consuming high cost sector it was in the economy. And uh, then I have taken, become almost a full time student in the 10 years of Sound Transit. Hmm. Well, we need to go back to five years ago and to the Seattle PI in uh, January, uh, I think of January 25th, 2001, there's the, the great David Horsey cartoon. Emery, tell us about this. What, what David was capturing there is that Sound Transit, five years before, had sold a package to the voters. The key part was Link Light Rail. And so five years before 2001, so it's 1996. That's right, 1996. And they gave a price, they gave a time schedule. Everything was not according to the way they gave it. Uh, the price was, at that point, $4 billion. It had gone from 2.3. It was three years behind schedule. Um, what it is today, the price is in the range of six billion, and it's at the least ten years behind schedule. So it's it slipped further in the last five years than it had at the time that David Horsey had this wonderful cartoon illustrating what a lemon the mm. system is. Well, I just want to make sure that the the public knows there are other points of view in this, and uh, you'll probably find most of them on SoundTransit.org. And uh, so, if you have any questions or comments with regard to some of the things that you hear tonight, go to soundtransit.org and try to find the information out. And if it's not there, give them a call. Okay, let's go to the Sounder. Jim, the Sounder is uh, the train between Tacoma and supposedly Everett, I guess. The original plan was to go from Seattle to Tacoma, 40 miles. After the plan was rejected in 1995 and came back in 96 with a reduced light rail, they expanded Sounder to 82 miles from Everett mm. to Tacoma. Well, let's go to an article from the Seattle Times of uh, August of 2006. Uh, the headline is Sounder created, uh, Commuter Rail Faces Growing Pains. And let, we have multiple quotes because the quotes are very interesting. The first one is, let's see, let's go to the first quote if we can. Uh, nine trains were supposed to be ready by 2002 and reach all the way to Lakewood in South Pierce County, but the line won't get that far to 2011. Is that, is that right? That's right. So what happens with all of our money that we're spending on it? Well, I mean, the, the, the quick of the story is that um, it was supposed to be all operating in 2002. And actually, the nine trains are just talking about the southern route. There were to be six mm. trains in the north, so there were to be a total of 15 trains. Oh. So it was supposed to be operating in all, entirely in 2002. And the latest estimate for the full operation is 2011, if there's no more mm. slippage. Uh, let's go to the next quote, uh, because the next quote is uh, interesting as well. Nonetheless, the line carries only half the riders that the politicians predicted in, in 1996 when the voters passed a regional ballot measure to fund rail bus and uh, park and ride facilities. Yeah, and this is this is touted by Sound Transit and often by the media as a great success, terribly popular, you know. So it's got half, half the riders. It's got half the riders. It's, um, well, let's see, I guess it's nine years behind schedule in terms of fully being completed. 
the operating cost per passenger is well beyond double what the price was supposed to be, and the projected capital price is more than double. Well, let's get back to the success of this in just a moment. Let's go to the next quote then. Uh, the next quote is still, commuter trains will never carry enough people to ease traffic congestion in such a vast area. What they do provide is a travel option that won't turn people into monsters, as Sound Transit's latest ad campaign suggests. So is that what we're doing? We're just make, making people feel better? I think Jim should give an idea of how <laughs> much it costs us taxpayers for each person who rides on Sound All right, well, let's go on to the next slides because that's going to help you do that. Uh, the next slides is it's easy on Sounder if it comes to a, a dear price to taxpayers. Just how much? I've been looking at the numbers. There's a tendency in the transit industry to not show what capital costs are when it comes to cost per ride. But capital cost plus operating cost divided by number of riders uh, shows that over the 25 year projection period, it's going to average about $35 of public subsidy per boarding, per rider. They bring their computers, have a nice luxury ride, mm -hmm. but we're paying a large price to provide But, that but we have this alternative, though, that doesn't create monsters out of people. Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't presume that the people who ride it are, appreciate how much they are subsidized, but um, it's I think it's great that they think it's a wonderful ride because it sure is costing an awful lot of money and money that could be so much better spent in other ways. Let me ask this, is that, is that per ride or is, that, is the ride uh, round trip? One way. One so way. it's one way, so it's yeah. $70. Yes. Yeah. And $70 a day, five days a week, $350 a week, let's multiply that out by uh, four and a third weeks in a month, so that's roughly $1,400 a month. That's a heck of a car payment. It's more of a subsidy than somebody on the highest level of Social Security income is getting as a retired person. That's amazing. How do they justify that? They're sound transit. They don't have to justify it. They've got the authority. Speaking of authority, let's go to back to that, uh, to that article because I want to go to the last part of the quote. The last part of the quote, but the rail corridor is privately owned, so sound transit had to pay uh, Burlington and Northern for expensive track and signal upgrades for safety and so so more freight trains could run during the hours that aren't taken up by sounder so we have all of this subsidy fourteen hundred dollars a month going to somebody to to ride back and forth on the train and yet we we don't own the track no but no we don't own the track and but whether we own the track or not one of the things that people don't realize is that the life of a system like this is in the range of 30 to 40 years. And in fact, our contract with Burlington Northern is 40 years. Oh, so we're just renting space. And so when the 40 years runs out, we've got to pay it all over again. Jim? We also pay for every train run over those tracks. When Sounder, when the track, a landslide closes the tracks, fortunately, the train runs are not charged, but it's uh, I'm not sure what the number is per train run, but we pay every time the train runs on Burlington Northern's track. But that's, in, that's included in the $1,400 per month subsidy that goes yes. to the person. Right. I see. Um, and then there's one other aspect of this, and it's where to park. And in this article of August of uh, 2006, it's um, the park and riser is the primary way people get to Sounder and parking lots continue to be built and Sound Transit is likely to include additional parking areas if voters approve a second round of transit projects next year. Basically, fueling urban sprawl. And um, I remember a few years ago there was a study done, and, and perhaps, Jim, you may have even participated in it, but it was that uh, a huge percentage of the cars that were in the Mercer Island park and ride came from 10 miles to the east. Well, from the east, how far is a good question, but. Um, and that may be changing as I-90 congests further and further eastward and transit gets more and more priority use of that roadway. That will probably change. But yes, park and ride is a free subsidy to park your car and avoid building more parking spaces in downtown Seattle and as it's becoming uh, more urbanized in downtown Bellevue. 
So it's a great subsidy to those urban cars. Mm -hmm. So it's actually it's an okay thing then from a transportation standpoint for there to be the park and rides? I have mixed emotions on that. <laughs> well, why is that? Uh, I'd just soon not comment. Okay, all right. But, but one of the things that I, that I think that people need to realize is there's all this talk about transit-oriented development, mm -hmm. but virtually 100% of the people using sound, using sounder drive to the stations. They have, they have as many parking spaces as they have people riding the train. So that there's talk about transit-oriented development, but basically it's transit f that facilitates driving and living far off in the countryside. Now, haven't there been some studies that show that something like 80% of the people who are riding Sounder used to ride the bus? I, you know, I, w I don't know what the figures are, and I, that sounds high to me. I think that there's a better ratio than that, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. because I'm not aware that they've ever definitively studied it. At the outset, they were planning on 30% on being new riders and 70% having been bus riders. They, they believe they're doing better than that, but I've never seen any clear studies. Has Sound it. Transit ever changed its estimate that uh, basically its system will take no more than one out of every thousand cars off the road? I'm not sure I would believe even one out of every thousand, but that's probably the high end of what their system will do, their system alone. Yeah, their system alone. Hmm. Interesting. Let's get on to something else. Um, there is a great graphic. Yeah, I wish that everybody could have it in front of them at, the, at this time, but uh, let's explain it if we can. Let's go to it's the percent of daily uh, person trips by transit in the central Puget Sound. Now, Jim, what's the red line that's going down? The red line is is showing what has actually been measured year by year in terms of ridership. The blue line, starting with the highest one in uh, 1995, was mm -hmm. what the future projection of transit use would be, and this is in terms of percent of So the in, in the mid-1960s, it was as high as 6% of the public in the central Puget Sound were riding mass transit. Wait, wait, is that right? just, just to clarify, it means of all of the trips taken in a day, Six percent of the trips I see. were on transit. Were on transit, and that the red line is the reality, but the blue line is what the Puget Sound Regional Council said is the way it's going to be. Yeah, here, here, here. Is, you see what is what is happening? It's it's down and it's been continuing to go down. Lately, it's kind of stabilized. It looks like at well under three percent. Mm -hmm. The blue lines are what we were supposed to get if we voted for Sound Transit. So in '95, that first blue line is what we were supposed to get. Now, we that was vote. a promise because that was what we were voting on, yeah. right? We did vote okay. for Sound Transit. Then some time passed, and then it was revised down because of experience. Mm -hmm. And then some time passed, and then it was revised down some more. And then some more time passed, and it revised down some more. And I suspect after some more time, it'll be re mm -hmm. revised down more. But the blue st line shows the descending claims of what all that money will get us. Hmm. Let's go to the next slide, though, because the next slide talks about the money. And the, the next slide here is transportation tax revenues in King Pierce and Snohomish. Jim, uh, you actually prepared this, right? Very few people realize what proportion of our tax dollars is going into transit spending versus road spending. We're all quite familiar with the fact that we haven't done much to uh, uh, expand our road system to meet the expanding demand on it. What this is showing that in 1990, which is the far uh, left end of the diagram, we were spending 70% of our transportation tax dollars on roads and 30% on transit. Transit spending is the orange upper portion, highway spending is the blue lower portion. And today, we're now spending about 50 percent on roads and 50 percent on transit. And, and to repeat, the 50 percent on transit is serving three percent, less than three percent of the trips. But if you yeah. build it, they will come. Um. <laughs> Maybe not. We're going to take a break. It's halftime right here on Public Exposure. Jim McIsaac and Emery Bundy, transportation experts, are here talking with us about the, eff the effective or ineffective expenditure of your transportation dollar. If you have more questions, go to their website 
at uh, www.bettertransport.info slash PITF. Now that stands for Public Interest Transportation Forum and I'm going to grab some of your papers. Right here, this document right here is the original sound move document from 1995, is it Emory? 96. 96. And this document you won't find on the Sound Transit website, but you will on the Public Interest Transportation Forum website right there at bettertransport.info slash PITF. Thank you very much. So, Jim, let's get back to the numbers. The, uh, as Emory pointed out, we're spending now um, a greater percentage and, of course, greater dollars on a lesser percentage of people in transportation. And as we project that forward, transit funding is based on sales tax. Sales tax generally increases at almost double the rate of inflation. Road funding is based on fuel taxes, and generally it's frozen out of so many cents per gallon, so it's, it dies against inflation. Mm -hmm. The two latest tax increases we've witnessed, uh, the nickel tax in 2003 and the current 9.5 cent tax, it's, that has not even brought us back against inflation to where we were in 1990, whereas transit spending, as you saw in that diagram keeps growing. Mm. Well, let's go actually to the to the next graphic because the next graphic helps with this in terms of the projection. Um, yes, this is uh, with RTI ID and, and Sound Transit 2 and Transit all added, all new added in 2008. Tell us what this is. Uh, RTID of course is the Regional Transportation Improvement District that is being promoted to try to catch up on the highway funding. Uh, ST2 is the second phase of sound transit that'll be, both of those will be coming before taxpayers next November for new tax approvals. And, uh, but as you can see, as time goes on, transit continues to grow. The, the graph takes us out to 2030, at which time, even with those increases in road taxes, trend, road spending will now only be about 37% of our transportation dollar. And this is for our three county Puget Sound region. So we're going to have to have uh, realistically as much as, uh, as 50 to 60% of the trips being taken on mass transit for it to be able to even come close from a financial standpoint of paying for itself. Is that right? That's right. And as you saw from those earlier blue line sketches, we're now looking at four and a half percent on transit by 20, 2020. So 60 some percent of the money and they'll accomplish four and a half percent of the trips if they succeed. And four and a half percent of the trips is, uh, is going up 33 percent of what it is right now. Yeah. I want to ask this, and I've been asking this question for quite a long time now, seven years probably, right here on Public Exposure, and one person probably had the best answer, but why are we doing this? Well, um, that's a good question. I mean, I, th I, th I think it's this. Politicians love cap big capital projects because there's vendors that, that get contracts and they make contributions to the politicians. There's unions that get work and they, uh, it, Mayor Nichols would not have been elected if it hadn't been for the construction unions. Um, so it's, they, they, would, they would much rather have a big capital pork barrel project than just methodically improve the system. I mean, that's, that's the short of it. And then there's a lot of people out there who have a romantic idea about rail. I regard it as kind of quack medicine. I mean, we got congestion. They think this is some sort of a magic answer. They don't look at the actual numbers of what is happening. What does it cost? What do we get? They just have a you know, romantic notion, a kind of miracle cure for cancer for our transportation woes, and the money's going to sound transit. I asked the same question of Jim Vesley, the uh, editorial page editor of the Seattle Times, and he looked at me aghast as if, you know, don't I know? And he said, Stan, it's the religion of light rail. Is it a religion? Does it have that kind of fervor with it? Very much so. Um, we have been being taught that to drive a car is a sin, even though 96% of all our trips can only be accomplished by driving a car. Um, so politically, it's, we've been convinced that we need to build rail. We can't, as you said before the break, we can't build our way out of it, referring to roads. 
Well, actually, we can, even on our east side of the lake. Oh, but, but I have to give you some statistics from Sound Transit. They claim that their line will replace 12 lanes of traffic. Let's go to that graphic if we could. Uh, because uh, actually, and, then, and that's the question, can light rail carry as many uh, uh, persons as a 12-lane freeway? Well, I, I-5 is basically a 12-lane freeway, at least crossing the ship canal and for several miles each side. What this graphic illustrates in the upper blue is the people moving movement on I-90 today. On I-5? Uh, I mean on I-5 today from uh, SeaTac to Northgate. The red represents the, the 2020 forecast of the rail system ridership when it's built out from SeaTac to Northgate. And it's nowhere near that. What's that tiny little tan part? That's what we're building right now. And the what initial be, segment. The initial segment from downtown Seattle to the airport. I, that I, will be completed in 2010. I just want to repeat, um, stand for emphasis. The blue is what is actually being done on I-5. I mean, this is, this is the official data. The little blocks down at the bottom is what Sound Transit hopes it will do, and it's surely not going to reach even that level. It's what they hope they're going to do by 2020, and they go around right and left and proclaim that that little bit is going to equal the capacity of 12 lanes of freeway. And they've got lots of people convinced because they repeat it all the time and because they're in, in an important role. Hmm. Well, I do want to go back to this, though. Um, the if you build it, they will come. Is that is that accurate? I used to live in Washington, D.C. Um, the city couldn't exist, I don't think, uh, hardly at all without uh, the rail system that it has. I've uh, been to New York a lot. Clearly, it, wouldn't, it would not be able to stand the traffic that it would have without the rail system it has. Those cities are several times more dense than our region here. And when we say, if we build it, they will come, we have to remember, in the next 30 years, we're going to have another one and a half million people coming to this region with their cars, and they're going to drive them. So we need to do something for highways, but as we discussed earlier, it seems like all the focus politically is directing us to putting money into transit. And as those original, that original graph of the red line of transit usage falling, the blue lines keep coming down in terms of prediction of future use. Obviously, we're building transit, and they're not coming. I want to be sure to get to, to, get to this last graphic. Uh, yeah, I think this would be a good time for Jim to talk about the rail versus bus on the east side that's we, coming up. We want to do this right here? I think so. Okay. I think this would make a lot of I, I don't. I don't want to skip yeah. over that one graphic yeah. that we've got there. Where are no, I think guys? this would be a good segue to that. Okay. Uh, we're going to get this graphic up. And Jim, if you could please explain what it is. This graphic is illustrating uh, on the left side the rail plan, the master plan. By the time it's built out in dollars over the time it's being built, $42 billion of investment. The right side 42 is... 42 billion. 42 billion. Wow. Okay. And on the right side, we're showing what could be done with buses. And in fact, our phase one of the sound transit to uh, sound move effort has already built half of those buses. The bus lines themselves have been placed in service for six, $60 million. Hmm. Maybe another... Uh, 100 million, we could complete a system shown on the right. So this right here cost us $43 billion, almost $43 billion. And this over here, some of which is already built, cost us how much? Uh, probably 100 million in buses, bus equipment and bus bases. We're also building uh, access ramps into the HOV lanes along 405, 520, I-90. And we're also building transit centers and park ride lots. So those add a lot more money to the bus uh, express so, bus So are system. we getting to a religious experience again? But because the buses aren't part of the of the sect, we can't get there. That's right. I mean, what what? I mean, the irony is what's happened over the last ten years. And since we're ten years into a ten-year plan, it's not a bad time to take a look at how we've done. Is that the one area of the Central Puget Sound because they have they divided into five sub areas. 
East King County is the only sub-area that doesn't have a train. East King County is carrying more transit passengers of sound transit than all of the others combined. East King County doesn't have any de depth. The others are, are borrowed to the hilt because the buses that have been implemented in East King County have been so much more productive and cost effective than the rail projects. So what Sound Transit wants to do is have another phase where they quit doing that in East King County and they just put the money into rail. And that was the plan that you were seeing up there, that part of the $44 billion rail system, including to, to Redmond. Well, we have separation of church and state, but we don't with regard to rail, do we? Not really, no. <laughs> And is there a way to By stop By church it? and state, you mean? Yes. Bus yes. The, the religion, no, I mean the religion of light rail. We, oh. we don't have the ability to stop that and go with, with something that is obviously more effective and less costly. The voters have that ability in November of 2007 to decide whether we're going to continue to put all the majority of our transportation dollars into rail transit or get more conservative with bus transit and do a little bit more. Are the voters the willing to say, though, that we won't get fooled again, like we were in 1996? I don't know if the voters understand whether they're being fooled or not. See, in, in my view, and this is a great tragedy, a tremendous um, absence of civic, civic leadership, and that is that sound transit spends more money promoting itself in lobbying, public relations, and media buys than it was supposed to, and in this plan, than it said it would spend on its entire central administration. And it's effective doing it. And not only does it propagandize its story uh, very effectively, but it's become one of the biggest buyers of media time and space, which has intimidated the media. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons that you don't have tough reporting on Sound Transit is because Sound Transit is a big client. Wow. We've got hours more to talk about, but we have five seconds, so we've got to go. Jim, Emery, thank you very much for being with us. Learn more about this issue so that when it comes time to vote, that you'll have enough facts to be able to know the best way to vote. We'll see you right here next week on Public Exposure. Take care. <laughs>